All right, so before we begin, uh, we'll start with a, to build a common understanding. What is the business process? Any business is a collection of business processes. Every day, knowingly or unknowingly, we interact with business processes. Even today, you would have interacted with several business processes. You registered, you went to a hotel, you, know, you checked in, checked out, contract renewals, loyalty programs, all these things are part of the business process. When we interact with them, either we provide input to a business process, something like you turned in an expense report, you got an output from a business process, like you get an invoice at the end of it, or you get the goods that you asked for, or as a part of your job, you are part of the business process, which means you're performing tasks as a part of the business process. Let's say in a purchase order, you are the approving authority. You know, somebody submits a report, you kind of comes to your table, you approve it, and you move on. You are being part of that business process. A business process could be simple or could be complex, depending on number of steps it has, number of the systems it needs to talk to. It could be triggered manually. It could be triggered on a seek, uh, on a, it could be triggered automatically, or you know, it kind of pulls for data around it. Irrespective of what type of a business process it is, there are a few things which are common to any business process. First, there is an input to a business process. Two, there is an output from a business process. In between these two steps, there is a series of tasks that you go through. And these are not just random tasks, there is a sequence in which you need to execute this task to generate the desired output from the input that you had. And most business processes also have some kind of decision framework in the middle which kind of takes input into the process, makes a decision, and alters the flow of the process. All right? In this particular example, we saw the customer data coming in, we validate it, kind of compute the order value based on the value, we either decide to approve or auto-approve it, and assign a shipper and ship it out. There is another very important characteristic of any business process. At any time, you cannot drop the data that you accept it. Because if you drop the data, there is no need for a business process, because there'll be no business. Nobody wants to do business when you drop data. In case there is any, any error in the business process, you want to take the data to a predefined store where it could be retrieved, salvaged, or manually handled, and moved on. All right, now that we have a common understanding of a business process, let's take a look at how the business processes are changing. Bill earlier talked about changes in the integration space. Let's see how it is impacting a business process. Take a simple example. Let's say hiring process in a large enterprise. In 2000, how it would start is something like this. There will be an HR system. The hiring manager is going to open a job request into the, into the hiring system. The candidate is going to discover the request, the job request, going to put in a resume. At certain periodicity, a matching algorithm would run, figure out the right fit, move this requirement into an, let's say, an interdepartmental LOB system. Say, hey, we need to interview this candidate. The LOB system then schedules the interview, kind of loops in the right people. Interview process begins, you know, the feedback is given in, kind of goes back to the same system. Let's say we decide to move ahead, we need external references. The references are collected, put back into the same system. Hey, it sounds good. We decide to hire the candidate, move it back to the HR system, and make an offer. A few key points I want to note here. The business process here, the BPM system here, is essentially orchestrating activities around this system. The number of systems is very handful. They're all enterprise. These systems don't change very often. Neither does the business process. It kind of go on for five years, 10 years without any changes. And in case you change something, like you change a business system, you will almost rewrite your business process. Now let's step forward. Oh, sorry, you mentioned you know, most of the communication happened, let's say email or one or two protocols. Let's move 2020, or maybe you know, let's look at it today, you know, let's not go too far in future. How does the same process work today? Again, it starts a similar way. We open a job request, but this time around, instead of an in-house HR system, I look at a service which is in SaaS, let's say Resumator, or maybe open a job opening, post a job opening on Monster. The candidate discovers it, uses the same SaaS system to talk to you and post his resume out there. 
we decide to move on, we look at more SaaS systems. Let's say we use Bullhorn or Workday to kind of go through the interview process and manage the whole process. The external references are collected via yet another SaaS service. And hey, how can we forget our favorite 20-year-old system because the payroll depends on it? You still need to put in the data into an enterprise system. The communication with the candidate happens no longer over just email. You need Twitter, you need Facebook, you need to send him text, kind of keep him updated about how the whole thing is going. You see how the business process has changed moving forward. One, you need to talk to lots of systems. You need to talk to the system in their languages, which will be different. Your business process needs to be resilient to the failures in the system because you're talking to various systems which are not in your control. You also need to talk to the enterprise system that you had. Another important characteristic which is coming up is this business process needs to be very agile. My company changed a contract from Resumator to Monster. Now my business process cannot change just because one of the SaaS services changes, which means your process needs to be agnostic to the changes in the other part of the process. All right, so far so good. So we see how these changes are putting a requirement onto the business process management systems. Okay, the business process management system can be defined in multiple ways. For the purpose of this session and the context that we have, let's pick up a simple definition. It is about automating and managing a process across SaaS and LOB systems. There are a few keywords here that I want to emphasize. First one is automating. It comprises of two steps. First one is modeling it, then you will be able to run it. The requirement to model a business process creates a blueprint it kind of documents the business process that everybody who is a stakeholder understands the business process. What is expected at every stage, what is the desired output, and a measurable output coming out of a business process. Now, once you model it, you want to run it. I mean, you can pick up any tool to model a business process. It's just nothing but a fancy piece of paper. You want to pick up the definition of the business process that you just created to be used by your runtime engine. The next very important step is managing a business process, which means the stakeholders at any time should be able to query the system and figure out what state my business process is in. Is there a success or a failure? What are the causes for those success and failures? And build an entire inventory of the diagnostics on top of it. Now we define the requirements coming from the modern world. You know, we have a definition. Before we move further, we took this definition and the requirement onto certain common biz talk patterns. We looked at some of the previous patterns that we know most of our customers use and say, do they put any additional requirement on the BPM system that we're going to go build? We picked up five patterns, which are the most commonly used. I'm going to run through each one of those slowly and tell you what additional requirement the BPM system we are building, it needs to fulfill those requirements. All right? Let's pick up the most common approval workflow we talked earlier. It typically starts with somebody submitting an expense report, uploading the data along with it, and then sends it for a manager approval. The manager need not approve right when you submit an expense report. It could take a day, it could be longer. The first requirement it puts on us is the business process management system that you have needs to support long running processes. The long running mean it could be a day, it could be a week, it could be months. When the condition is met, which means the manager approves in this case, you need to resume the process from where you left and move on to the next steps. Now, based on the outcome of this step, you can take a different path. Now, let's look at the requirement that kind of this thing is putting on one. Your business process management system needs to support long-running processes. Two, it needs to support conditional execution, the condition which is based upon and data in the system. Let's look at the next one common workflows. Most business processes, uh, sorry, the most enterprises, there are certain processes which are common across. Let's take an example. Running a credit check on a requirement. Your loan approval process would need it. Any other business process in the organization would need it. This is the kind of crux of a system which is encapsulated in a common fashion. Other business processes, let's say a new loan application, can anytime call into it and move on to the next steps. I shall be able to change my policy for a credit check in one single place, 
and everybody who depends upon it would get the benefit out of it. Here we get our second requirement for a business process system that we are building. You shall be able to call it another workflow in two fashion. One, either wait for the response before you move or trigger another workflow. Let's say log this entry into the system and I don't care for it to finish and move on to the next one. The next common pattern that Vista customer will identify more is a sequential convoy. You get a customer order, but you don't want to process it right then. You want to wait, let's say, for 50 orders to come in. I need a mechanism to batch the orders. And I want this functionality out of the box in my business process system. While I'm waiting for this, the rest of the 49 messages to come through, I cannot drop my message. I need an assurance that once I send you a message, you're not going to drop it. Next. I want to find the quotes. Now, my algorithm in my organization to find quotes is very different from what you supply, which means my developers are going to give me a custom code, which is going to be the, give me the quotes from my partners. Business process should be extensible. I shall be able to run a custom code at any location of my desire. And next, once I calculate, you know, I shall be able to again make a decision. So we generated some of the additional requirement. You'll see the overlap as we go around these processes of what we are building. The next one is a parallel convoy. A typical example of a parallel convoy is you call up a doctor's office to schedule an appointment. Before you get an appointment, somebody needs to do an insurance approval. Make sure that the lab reports that the doctor asked last time are already in. Till they come in, you're not going to get an appointment. Now, the insurance company is not going to send you the approvals in the same order in which you ask for, or in the same order in which lab is sending you the report. They're going to send it at their own frequency, which means the inputs are not coming to you in the order that you ask for. They're random. Now, we need to provide a mechanism in which we wait for the right set of input before I move on and schedule an appointment and send you a confirmation. If you guys notice, I said send you an SMS. Now you also need a connector to a service which can automatically send you text using this business process. So now what we're talking here is support for an order of order input set and connectivity to a SaaS system, which could be Twilio or any other service that your organization want to use. The last one I want to use here is a scatter gather pattern, which is where you kind of dispose the requirements onto multiple system which work in parallel, gather the data back, and get you one output. Let's say we want to do a marketing campaign. I want to scan Twitter and Facebook for a particular tag. This thing runs every so often, let's say once in every 24 hours. I need a scheduler. I need an ability to do parallel execution here. I don't know how to search Twitter and Facebook. I need connectors to those two systems. Next, I want to create a digest out of it, which is my custom code again. I want to run my custom code, create a merge report again, and send it out. You see, we've seen a bunch of those requirements earlier. Now let's kind of recap what we just saw before we go to the next section. Here are the key tenets that any business process management system for today's world would need to have. You need connectivity to SaaS and LOB systems. We saw in the previous example how the modern hiring process will need to connect to multiple systems. Next, you need to be agile. You shall be able to change any part of the business process without impacting every other part, which means the dependency between the processes should be limited. You don't need to depend on a developer cycle for months to kind of make changes to business process. Your BA shall be able to make changes to the process, shall be able to reconfigure it, maybe put together an entirely new business process without any help from a developer. Long-running business processes. We saw the requirement, you know, you need to be able to persist the state. You need to have a requirement to execute the, uh, the task in a sequential or a conditional order. You need to have an if-then-else, you need to have for loops, and how we all programmers understand it. We saw the requirement for a rich business functionality. Our EI friends would know, you know, you need to validate activity right out of the box. You need transform. You need an ability to parse ad effect data. Again, last, sorry, not the last, you know, this is a very important part, you know, 
in any business process, you cannot really lose the data. You need a guarantee. Once a message is received, it's not going to be lost. You need end-to-end -end tracking. And the last of it, it needs to be extensible. No matter how much of a rich functionality we put in, things are going to change. There will always be a new requirement, which would not require you to replant the entire business process. It should be extensible. You shall be able to roll in your functionality. There shall be a platform for you to collaborate and share the functionality from the other, other partners. All right. I think we have talked enough and built a common ground to say what a modern business process management system needs to have. And let's see how we are solving this problem. We are building a platform to solve these requirements. There are two primary tenets around the platform that we are building. We'll, in a few minutes, we will see a demo of it. The first one is what we call is the developer persona, which is a functionality. You need to be able to encapsulate the business functionality in an atomic way that is reusable. And then you need a business analyst to be able to create a business process which is orchestrating through this functionality to create the entire business process. Because earlier we said you know, business process is nothing but a sequence of these activities. How a developer does it? He creates this functionality as atomic units. And a BA, it makes it available to BA who would be able to put together to make sense out of it. I think in the earlier session, you heard the term microservices. The new platform supports a developer to build functionality as a microservice. A microservice is a small service that can be deployed on its own. It runs in a sandbox. It communicates to other services using a lightweight protocol, say HTTP resource API. You could build your microservices in multiple languages. It's no longer C sharp only. You could do it in Java, Node.js, and other things. So basically, you bring in your code, wrap it around as an API, and make it available to the platform. As a part of the platform, we will have a rich set of microservices out of the box. You're going to see the best of functionality, the standard functionality of validates, transform, rules, kind of reading through AS2 messages and everything else available right out of the box. There will be a platform for third parties to share the functionality among themselves. Some of the examples of this functionality are connectors. And then we talked about earlier connecting to Facebook and various enterprise systems. The talk after this, Samir is going to talk about you know, how do you, uh, the various microservices that we're going to ship out of the box. Let's focus on the next aspect, you know, which we're going to talk in the rest of the session, is orchestrating a business process using these microservices. A BA, the BA's primary job is going to be configuring a microservice. Let's say you're using a Facebook Connect. A BA shall be able to provide credentials that he's going to go use to connect to the Facebook, product, uh, Facebook portal. He shall be able to use the data into the further microservices to configure them. He shall be able to use conditional workflows to kind of put together a business process. And end of it, all this functionality is going to be available in a web-based process designer. And all, as a part of the platform, we are shipping a very powerful workflow engine. Let's spend a minute talking about the workflow engine next. I think you will see some of the requirements that we talked earlier. We're going to bind it together here and see how the requirement, how the workflow engine that we're shipping fulfill some of those requirements. The workflow engine that we are shipping calls into other microservices or API offering. This is a very important distinction. In the new platform, microservices do not talk to each other. Microservices talk to each other via the workflow engine. So it's a workflow engine which orchestrates the flow between one microservice to another microservice. It will be able to call into it, get the response back, persist the state, Look at the graph and find out the next microservice to be executed and call into the next one, and so on and so forth. It will, in a minute, we will have more details on it. The workflow engine will support sequential and conditional workflows. That's one of the requirements that we earlier talked about. It will support long-running workflows and persist state between each of those executions. Once you start a workflow, you shall be able to stop it. You shall be able to pause it and resume it any time using APIs or the portal that we talked earlier. It will provide the message assurance that we talked. 
every stage, the work, at every step, the workflow engine is going to generate logs. These logs can be used to build feature functionality, let's say business BAM. All these jet logs will be available again via portal or via API. We do have plans to use this data in, in future to kind of build a richer engine like a BAM engine on top of it. All right, I think I'll break here and, and invite my colleague Prashant to kind of give you a demo to put what we talked about in perspective and then we'll take it from there on and go under the hoods. Great, so um, that's SurveyMonkey. Um, some of you might have used the tool to send out surveys to potential customers. Um, and so, you know, we kind of put together a demo, uh, a demo survey uh, that we requested you to fill a little while ago. Uh, uh, seems like a great bunch of responses have come in on that particular survey. Thanks for filling that in. And uh, let's look at the responses for a minute, right? Uh, so let's say that I'm from Acme and I wanted uh, to see uh, how people are responding to the survey, who are the people who are interested in the products that uh, we have, and um, there's like a bunch of contact information that's sitting out here that I'm like really excited about. I wanna go pass that on to my sales team so that they can start calling you and hounding you. Uh, Right, uh, but then uh, SurveyMonkey is kind of a great tool for collecting data, but that's not where I'm gonna go run my sales team from, right? Uh, where I really want these particular set of leads to show up is in, say, my Salesforce account, uh, which kind of uh, sitting with some of the data in the leads that's already showing up, right? So uh, how am I gonna go take this data, sitting in SurveyMonkey, and then see who's interested, and then just go push that into um, into Salesforce, right? So uh, we're gonna to put together a workflow that does exactly that, right? Um, so let's get back to the uh, workflow uh, portal that uh, we guys showed you earlier today. Uh, you guys already know how a new workflow gets created. That's, I'm gonna to go to new, and let's look at everything. Um, again, you know, the gallery of things that you can go create in Azure shows up, uh, workflows right on top in this particular demo. And uh, we've got a template that we put together so that uh, you know we can kind of start talking about that almost about immediately, right? So uh, we've uh, we've got this demo that's pre-baked, and we're gonna now see how I can go configure this and tweak it to my needs to be able to go produce a workflow that does exactly what I need. That's gonna take the data from SurveyMonkey and go put it into Salesforce, right? Um, so let's start with the left-hand side. You've got uh, an on-demand schedule kind of a workflow. It's not something that I'm gonna go trigger off when MD response comes into sales, uh, into SurveyMonkey. So I'm just gonna go you know, run it once, or maybe say once a month, and pick data from the survey responses and see what I can go do with that, right? Uh, so uh, an on-demand uh, workflow is essentially something that have to come to the portal to run. It doesn't run on its own. Uh, that's, where we got, that's what we're gonna do once we go create this workflow. Uh, what, uh, what, what, that, what the workflow does first is it's got a SurveyMonkey connector, uh, which you see out here. Uh, this connector takes in two simple inputs that uh, you know, uh, we've coded up. It takes in the um, name of the survey, uh, which you guys saw. That's the Integrate 2014 survey. And it takes a bunch of uh, comma-separated values that uh, we are gonna pick and uh, a poll from the SurveyMonkey responses. Uh, it's essentially the logic we've coded in here is gonna take the text and go look for that in the question, get the response out, and then send it back to me, right? Um, once I have the results from uh, SurveyMonkey, this is one primary thing that I wanna do, which is essentially go put this into Salesforce, right? Uh, now, Salesforce is not gonna go take this data as is. We need to kind of go, go map it to the fields that a Salesforce connector would expect, right? Uh, so if you've got a map shape sitting right there in the middle, uh, that takes the output of the survey monkey shape. And it, uh, so the, uh, let that, let's close the, which takes the output of the survey monkey shape and, uh, you know, passes it to this custom mapper uh, that I have sitting here, right? Um, it's also got a map expression that's uh, kind of our uh, early code in terms of how the map would work. We would also have uh, a transform that, uh, uh, that Samir is gonna talk about later today in the EAI session that looks a lot more like uh, a transform that you've been familiar with in this talk uh, and is a lot more richer and powerful. Uh, but I think the point I'm trying to make here is that 
uh, you have the ability to take the output of one box and go wire it up to the next one just by doing a clear, clean reference out there, right? Um, and then uh, finally, once I have my data mapped to what Salesforce needs, I'm gonna go put in my Salesforce connector uh, and say that, hey, pick the output of the map and just go push that into Salesforce. Um, this is work under progress, so when we actually ship this connector to Salesforce, you're gonna have a lot more fields out there that take in your credentials and information. Some of these things are hard-coded to the core right now, uh, and uh, you, know, you would see that uh, uh, connectivity questions and uh, the connectivity parameters is gonna be or part of the configuration that's gonna be taken in here, right? Okay, so that, that kind of would achieve the primary purpose of this workflow. Uh, I wanna do something uh, more with that. You know, if you kind of went through the survey, it had questions about how interested are you uh, in the products that Acme has. Uh, so uh, we wanna go uh, put a filter on top of the output. And so that anything uh, that people were like really, really interested in, uh, I can get an email in my inbox uh, right away so that I can start following up on those leads. I don't have to kind of wait for the entire regular sales process to kick in. You know, I just get it in my inbox and I can go start following up with those guys, right? So uh, essentially I'm gonna take the output of the Survey Monkey data again um, and then see uh, who's interested uh, and like really, really interested in the, uh, in the product that we're shipping. And uh, once I have that filtered data, I'm gonna send that off in an email uh, to me, right? So uh, that's the, um, that's the uh, settings sort of that are there for my SendGrid uh, connector. And it basically picks the output of the priority leads filter uh, box out there and pushes it to SendGrid, right? Uh, let me do actually one more fun thing out here, right? Um, while we're at it, let's also kind of, you know, we said that we'll have a raffle along with uh, the survey data that you guys fill in. So let me kind of uh, see how I can modify this workflow to uh, pick a winner out of the folks who responded to the survey. So I'm gonna add an action. And uh, when I say add an action, it's gonna pick up from the set of actions that are available as first party. That's the microservices that Alok's been talking about. Or uh, this gallery could be filled up by uh, actions that are provided by third party partners uh, who provide connectors to legacy like, systems uh, or to uh, you know, other, um, uh, other SaaS applications that are coming up around the world. Um, the, let me find the uh, action that I wrote. Uh, that's a simple web API. Uh, which is implemented the microservice. Uh, it's called a random picker. It essentially takes an array of JSON objects and picks one random one out of that and returns it back. Uh, so I'm gonna take the survey monkey results and pass it to this particular service. And uh, that's pretty much the configuration. Uh, so when I click okay, uh, the designer now knows that there's an additional shape uh, it knows that it takes the output from SurveyMonkey, so it automatically wires it up for you to see that in a visual fashion. And uh, now the last step that I wanna go add is basically go send an email when that happens. Let's see, send an email. Okay, so I'm just gonna fill this one really quickly so that I can get an email. Um, uh, winner, and I'm gonna take the output of the random picker, and assuming I might have a text-based email, so I can go put that output in both of these, and hit okay. Okay, so that completes my uh, creating of the uh, workflow end-to-end. As you saw, uh, while we've been talking about like APIs that go behind the scenes, that's what the inputs that we were filling in, and the outputs of those APIs, that's what we were wiring out to the next set of shapes uh, downstream. Uh, it's really easy for uh, anybody to go just pick this up and uh, fill in the uh, required inputs and get the output and wire it up to the next shape, uh, if you will, in a designer, right? Um, and so, uh, let's just go hit create. What that does is it pins it to the start, 
uh, along with the control source workflow that we created a little earlier. And uh, I have this uh, survey show up, uh, uh, I have this uh, workflow show up uh, with absolutely no history so far. Uh, since this is a manually triggered survey, I'm just gonna go hit run on it and wait for it to trigger. So there you see, uh, the workflow is triggered, it's got an ID and uh, it's currently uh, running as accepted. And um, if I go back, uh, you know, I'm getting emails back into my inbox. I'm gonna pick the first one that came, um, right? Uh, so let's first look at the leads that showed up. Uh, you know, we kind of work on pre-printing this and adding shapes that allow you to see. But this is really the data that went into SurveyMonkey, got picked up by the, the connector to SurveyMonkey, sent back as a JSON to the workflow, passed on to send uh, the filter, and then to send grid to send back that in an email so that I can go start following up on that, right? And um, here's the first winner and the winner. Uh, for uh, for the prize we have today. Uh, so can uh, can we have Paul Porter please come up here and collect this prize? Hey, yeah. Let's go to the next step after this. Okay, this is what you just saw in the demo. Here's a quick recap. Uh, this is how my business process looked like. There was a manual scheduler, which is wired up to a survey monkey connector. And after that, I had a parallel execution of two tasks. One of them mapped my SurveyMonkey data to the Salesforce schema, and then put it into Salesforce. And the second path filtered the leads based on a certain criteria, which means the people who are really interested as a criteria we used, and then send an email to my salespeople. Let's see when we run this process, what happened underneath? How did the business process look like? This whole thing run on the workflow engine that we have been talking so far. So primarily, there are two databases as a part of the workflow engine. First one is execution state. This is where we have been talking about long running state persistence. This is where it persists state of the workflow after every step. The second store is a data store. This is where the data that comes out of an action and it gets stored and, being, and it's available to any other further shapes in the system to use. Let's see how the whole thing triggered. We talked about earlier triggering it manually. You know, we clicked on the scheduler, which went ahead and told workflow to create a new instance. The workflow responded back to it with an HTTP 200, okay, I got it. It created a new instance. It looked at the format in which we stored the workflow definition. What comes next as a survey monkey? It makes a call with an API called get survey data onto that action. That microservice responds back with HTTP 202 saying accept it. Now I know the next action that I have kind of depends on it so I cannot move on. The workflow engine behind the scenes keeps this evaluation all the time. That means I need to go back and wait for this activity to finish before I can go ahead. I call again with a get status. This time around I get HTTP 200 which means the survey monkey microservice has done its job and it's given me the data, which I take and put it in my data store for all the further shapes to use. Next, I look at there are not two shapes which can run in parallel. The workflow engine kind of schedules both of those in parallel. Let's look at one of those and it's a filter data. But wait, before we did that, we used the tracking database to create an entry of survey monkey shape had ran, it succeeded. This was the time it took and all the requirement of it around tracking and logging there. Now once I call the, the filter leads, I need to provide it, which was the output of the previous step. Now the output is available from what I stored in the database. That's where we talk about the guarantee that we won't lose the data come from. So you see the utilization of these two databases and there's another third database, which is a tracking database where we keep track of how my actions are being executed how long they are taking, what is the result of each step. This data is available via an API for you to build a rich diagnostics on. There will be some first party diagnostics coming up which will be utilizing the same data. The state that we save is transparent, which means at any time, during the workflow execution, you could go and make changes. You can alter the workflow definition while it is running. Okay. 
uh, the next steps are pretty obvious. You know, we kind of evaluate it next. It goes to the next one. Kind of keeps entering it. You know, the filter lead is done. It calls email. Then the mapping the survey is done. It calls into Salesforce. So all this happened. The, earlier we talked about uh, the communication between the microservices happened via the workflow. This is how the whole flow happens. The workflow invokes a microservice, waits for a response back, evaluates the graph, and moves on to the next ship to call them again. All right, let's take a minute and say how the workflow definitions are done. We saw in the designer, we drag drop those boxes. This is how behind the scene, we save the workflow definition. All the workflows are saved in a JSON format. You could manually write it in JSON, or you could use the designer that you just saw. There are primarily three, three sections to the JSON that in which we store the workflow definitions. The first one is what triggers a workflow, and what input it requires to trigger a workflow. The second one is what are the APIs that the workflow calls. These are the actions in the workflow that we called in a sequence. And under what condition do we call an API, which means what are the dependencies, shape, C depends on B and B depends on A. All the graph definition is provided in this JSON. And the next, when you call an API, what are the input it requires? The input it requires is something that can be utilized, which is an output of a previous step. Once you provide all this definition, the, the engine takes this definition and executes the way we saw. All right. Uh, we also talked about two more concepts called triggers and actions. Trigger is something that starts the workflow, action is something the workflow executes on. There will be a rich set of triggers and action available out of the box when we ship. However, you can always extend the platform. You could write your own triggers and action. The process is simple. You write the code, implement it as a microservice, define the API as a metadata, make it available to the designer, and designer shows it up on the surface in a first class way. Every trigger and action they're going to ship out of the box will be built in exactly the same way. Which means when you build your microservices, they are going to get a first party treatment on the design surface and all the way through. All we need is the metadata definition of the APIs that your microservice exposes, register with the designer, and it's all available for your customers to use. All right, a quick recap of the concept that we just talked about. First one, I want you to remember is a trigger. Trigger is something which starts a workflow instance. There are three types of triggers. A schedule one, which is a timer based or a manual. A push trigger, an example would be an HTTP trigger. Or a pull trigger, which periodically pulls your source, let's say FTP, to get the data. And once there's a new data, it starts the workflow instance. The next one is an action. This is a building block of all the workflows that we saw. These are the tasks that your business process needs to execute. This wraps that API that you just wrote. It supports input and an output. The input could be taken from any other action in the workflow before it executed, and the output will be available for all the further actions. Every action can, uh, can return in progress or a success or a failure, in addition to the logging that it wants to do. The last one is the workflow. The workflows are different than triggers. Triggers start a workflow. Workflows are a series of actions. It invokes action sequentially or conditionally based on how you compose the workflow. They persist state at, at every step. The instances, the workflow instances could be paused, resumed at any time. You could go to the portal or there are APIs available for you to do it. A workflow definition we saw is a JSON definition which could be done via the user interface, which is a browser-based, or you could do it manually, or using a tool of your choice. As long as it spits out the right JSON, we would run it. The workflow also generates rich logs for tracking. You saw in the previous example how at every step, you know, we were recording the step executed, the time it took, the, the, the result of the execution, success of the failure, and all the details along with it. All right. Uh, with these concepts, I'm going to wrap up the session. Here are a few things I wanted to take away. As a part of the platform, we'll be shipping up a workflow engine that's built for the modern processes. We spent enough time talking about the workflow engine and the capabilities and the requirement it needs to, to support. This will be shipped out of the box. 
There will be support for uh, all the things that we talked earlier. Two, the platform that we are building is extensible. Though it's extensible, what we will ship out of the box is going to be a very rich set of connectors that we are going to talk about in the next session. There will be a rich set of the BizTalk functionality. All the EAI and B2B functionality that you're used to of will be exposed as microservices in this platform. There will be a platform for ISVs to share their knowledge, which means they can build microservices and share with their customers. As an enterprise, you could also extend the platform by bringing in your custom code and rolling in your own microservices for your own use. And the last one, we will be shipping out of the box a very rich web interface for business analysts. If you remember, in the first slide, we talked about three primary requirements. You should be able to automate it. You should be able to run it. You should be able to monitor it. You should be able to do all those three using this web-rich interface that we're talking here. 